Hello, and welcome to Basin Safety Monthly Safety Trainings. This is your safety instructor, Jonathan Greiner. This month, we're going to be covering fire safety and extinguisher use, emergency response plans, and hot work. Glad you're here with us this month. There have been a lot of fires this winter, so moving into the spring and the warmer months, we want to reduce that. So with that, let's get this safety started. All right, so getting into the topics for this month's safety training, we're going to start with fire safety and extinguisher use. So we're going to talk about fire science, fire classification, and prevention. We're going to discuss hot work permits in a couple different areas today, fire watch requirements, NFPA symbols, site-specific safety for fire uh, hazards, training requirements, fire extinguishers themselves, exit routes and requirements, and emergency response and exit. So a lot of different things related to fire this month. Stay with us. Definitely a lot of good information here. Um, and with that, let's get into it. All right, there are four elements to a fire, and this becomes extremely important when you understand why fires happen, um, especially past the ignition state. I mean, a young child knows that if you light a match and put it up to paper, it's going to ignite. Now, the reasons that happens, we don't really learn until we get a little bit older in life, and here they are. So the fuel, in that case, let's say put it up to a piece of paper, that'd be the fuel. It's a combustible material. It could be a solid, such as paper, a liquid, such as gas, or a gas, which is you know propane, any, any sort of gaseous material. And the distinction between those three things, especially when you add heat uh, to that, is uh, becomes a lot less. Oxygen is another important thing, only needs 16% oxygen uh, to a mixture in order to uh, typically burn. And that's why a lot of the fire extinguishing media that we're gonna look at actually remove oxygen from the equation, which and if you remove any of these elements, it will prevent the fire from continuing. Heat uh, is the necessary energy required to um, ignite. Now, this is typically known as flashpoint, which does get confused with lower explosive limit. The lower explosive limit deals more with the oxygen and the, the mixture of gas to oxygen, um, uh, kind of the, the combination of those two things. That's our LEL. Heat and flashpoint are more closely related. And then lastly, the chemical chain reaction, which is the fourth part of this fire tetrahedron. It used to be known as the, tet the fire triangle. Uh, it changed about 20 years ago once they realized the importance of this. So that's the exothermic reaction. Uh, needed the energy for that needed to uh, ignite the fire and then keep the fire going the reason that's important and if you've taken this training from me before either in person or here on basin academy uh, the reason it's important to note that is paper for example paper itself does not light on fire it doesn't what happens is uh, heat moving towards and then making contact with that paper allows it to release uh, vapor um, releases a vapor which ignites and as that vapor ignites and the heat moves closer to the paper then the paper releases vapors more quickly and then as it continues obviously you know the more vapor it releases the larger the fire becomes um, and that that is a part of that chemical chain reaction so that's important to note kind of as we go through this and understanding again that how to fight a fire effectively so there are five fire classifications that are important to note. Um, we essentially break or categorize different types of fires based on their fuel source. Now, some of these fires can be multiple of these. Um, for example, if you have gasoline uh, that's dumped all over some material and then lit on fire, that is a class A and a class B fire. And we'll look at our extinguishers later. And it's kind of some of the logic to why you know these extinguishers have their classifications, which the most common one we see is A, B, and C. But we're going to break them down into their individual um, classifications for this uh, portion. So I've got a little bit of a cheat code here to remember these. So a class A fire is fibrous material, typically wood, paper, cloth, rubber, and some plastics. Uh, class B is any liquid such as gasoline, kerosene, paint, paint thinner, and propane. Uh, class A is anything that turns to ash. Class B is something that has a boiling point. So, for example, gasoline. If you take gasoline, put it in a, in a saucepan, and turn the stove up, put it on the stove and turn the stove up, it will boil. Uh, I highly, highly do not recommend this practice uh, at any time for any reason um, ever. But uh, yes, it will boil. Uh, C is anything that has charge or current moving through it. This is going to be your electrical fires, appliances, switches, panel boxes, power tools, um, any sort of ignition that happens there. Uh, 
D is for anything that dents, so combustible metals uh, are in the D category, magnesium, titanium, potassium, and sodium. And sodium is kind of interesting to me, but if just imagine if you take a block of sodium and you hit it with a hammer, it will dent. If you know that material will dent and compress together, uh, that's going to be our class D type material. And lastly, we have class K uh, or anything related to kitchen. So animal greases, fats, uh, vegetable oils, things of that nature are all in the class K fire. Um, so, you know, it's important to note that again, in all of these different types of material, um, you know, we want to know why they burn, what's required to put them out, and then also how to prevent them. And that's going to be our next section here is how to prevent different types of fires. So for a class A fire, uh, we're going to keep uh, really housekeeping and keeping things stored appropriately is a big thing. Uh, we've had a lot of dog house fires this year, which all began as class A fires and then slowly progress to class B and C because there's typically fuel inside or around uh, one of those and then also you know electrical equipment etc so guys will keep put clothes on a heater for example um, JSA books and you know if your JSA book is the reason for the safety hazard on your site you know you have a problem but it can't happen really anything uh, what ha what will happen again is even with paper it will heat up, release a vapor from the paper, right? It will fill the space and it will find an ignition source, whether it's a, you know, the heater itself, a, a heating element, a spark, someone smoking a cigarette. It can be a, a variety of things, a light switch. I mean, anything can cause uh, enough heat to ignite that vapor. So even if it's something that isn't typically going to be in a flammable situation and it doesn't even have to be touching the heating element, it just has to heat up enough to release the vapor that will find an ignition source. And as long as you have 16% oxygen, uh, you're going to have a fire. So we want to make sure that things are stored properly, you know, away from heating elements, etc. Very similar with class B, we obviously, you know, don't want to store a lot of uh, flammable material in one place. In fact, there are requirements uh, for how you store it. Um, but really, um, in smaller quantities, even you can have, uh, you know, some issues. So you want to make sure that they're in containers that are designed to prevent vapor from being released, right? If I've got gas inside of a, a metal gas can with a self-closing spring-acted lid, vapor is not coming out of that can. And if there's a fire that happens around that can because there's no vapors coming out, unless it gets hot enough to melt the metal, which could happen, but that's going to be one heck of a fire. And at that point, you know, probably that five gallons of gas that's inside the can isn't going to make a big difference. But, uh, if it's a plastic gas can, <clears throat> you know, with one of those lids, it's hard to get really tight and the little rubber seals get bad over time and that's releasing vapors. That's just going to ignite, draw down into the canister and then potentially ignite it or melt the plastic as well. So how we store things, where we store them, are they in locked or closing um, flammable storage cabinets, which kind of acts some somewhat similar to a... Um, a gas a metal gas canister you know we want to prevent vapors from from being exposed to ignition sources and so where we store these materials how much of them we store on hand and are they inside or outside all these things kind of take into account class c electrical this one's a little bit more complicated um, the types of fires that you're going to see with class c are different you have arc flash possibilities which would be a class c fire but some of these are so hot and so extremely dangerous. You're talking magnitudes hotter than the sun. Okay, some of these, you know, uh, arc flash fires. So it's a little bit different than paper uh, igniting on fire. Not that that's not hazardous or even gasoline, but it's just another level. Um, but any sort of cords that get that get nicked or cut. So making sure that your cord management is good, um, ensuring, and this is. A lot more on the planning phase and the engineering phase, but like making sure that circuits uh, match fuses, uh, match cord types, and, and ultimate, you know, how much amperage is being pulled uh, to whatever is being plugged in. All these things kind of take into account, but a class C fire is different than an A, B, or C, or excuse me, an A or B, specifically on the how it gets its energy, which in this case is on a continuous circuit. So that's something to keep in mind, mostly housekeeping with your cords and making sure the right materials installed. Class D is, uh, our, again, our combustible metals. Not all metals are combustible or considered combustible. Some of them melt, but some of them catch on fire, such as magnesium. So essentially, you know, if you are working with a combustible metal, storage and housekeeping is going to be extremely important. 
Um, one great example for this is uh, fighter jets, which use magnesium uh, as a part of their engine block system. Um, I think it's, a, it's actually a, an insulator in some cases. Um, but if magnesium catches on fire, um, if a jet plane, for whatever reason, catches on fire, they dump the thing in the ocean. They just push it off of, a, of, a, of the, the carriers and they just let it go into the ocean. They, they aren't messing around because that magnesium will melt through the plane, hit the deck of the boat, melt through the deck of the boat, and then continue on until it's actually, depending on the volume, until it actually goes through the hull of the boat and sinks the whole dang ship. So magnesium pretty serious, right? And uh, using things like water, which we'll get into a little bit later, will just add fuel to the fire, hydrogen and oxygen mix, and you may already know this, um, but they'll mix and you know create, it'll actually be fuel to that fire. So something to keep in mind. Class K, these are a little bit unique in that these types of uh, fires can reignite even after being extinguished because of the way that oils and greases will insulate heat um, and then find you know small bits of um, food or starch or anything to ignite itself again. So um, really removing oxygen or the possibility of oxygen is the way that you um, prevent this. And again, housekeeping, right? If, if you have you know, buckets of oil, you probably don't want to just leave that with the lid off. You probably want to cover that and, and secure it and kind of keep it off to itself. Um, we don't want things to get a lot of grease and material on them inside of hood vents and things like that because they'll ignite. So housekeeping is another extremely important thing, especially within the hospitality industry. So fire watch, we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about this really quick because we're going to get into it a little bit later. But uh, fire watches are people that are on standby uh, when there's hot work being performed and their job is to watch and make sure that after the work is performed a fire doesn't ignite and they got to be around for 30 minutes after the hot work's performed to ensure that nothing combustible ignites um, so there's, there's there's a lot of uh, different elements to conducting a fire watch properly um, if you are in a fire watch world you your job will be to kind of watch for fires make sure that there's nothing around that's going to cause the fire um, or be an ignition source for the fire, fuel for the fire, ensure adequate means of egress for people. If there is a hazard, taking care of it, um, being ready to contact the fire department and extinguish a fire and get everyone out in the event of a fire. PPE for a fire watch isn't that uh, much different, actually, than our typical PPE. The difference is it's good to have respiratory equipment available at all times, excuse me, uh, and then also a fire extinguisher kind of at the ready. All right, so NFPA uh, symbols that we have here, um, we want to make sure that we, um, you know, understand these symbols. So you'll see these uh, around specifically a lot of times on oil tanks, on saltwater tanks, on propane tanks. If you, you know, like to grill or if you go to the gas station, you'll see this. So there's a four uh, category symbol um, with different classifications. So blue is health, red is fire. Yellow is reactivity and white is reserved for specific hazards. Um, so if you see a three in the red, for example, and if you look really closely or zoom in here, you can see that a three um, indicates a material. Typically, it's going to be a, a class B type material uh, that has a flash point that's below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If you see a four, that's a flash point that's below 70 degrees Fahrenheit or essentially room temperature. So that's important to note. That's kind of what they mean in health hazards, get into health requirements, how toxic they are, et cetera, reactivity, same thing, and then special hazards. But we're gonna focus specifically on fire because that's the nature of the game today. Um, but yeah, so the number there is associative, to not to necessarily how flammable it is, um, but more so the flash point at which it ignites. So it's more of an indicator of what temperature it can be exposed to before it reaches its flash point. So well site specific, we do see, um, we're going to go specifically to well sites here, be more oil and gas focused. Um, I, I would say that this can be relatively easily uh, transferable to other industries, but we'll talk specifically about oil and gas here. So Stephis, uh, this is an example of a Stephis flare stack. It is designed to catch on fire. Uh, it has a little igniter switch in there, automatic. Um, some are not Stephis made, or Stephis is essentially an engineered stack, right? They have, you can make a flare stack out of a pipe. 
you know, and some hay if you want to. Um, usually the older style, though, they'll have a spark plug. There's kind of always a spark kind of happening uh, right there at the end. And, and that's where we send excess gas from the treater is to the flare stack. Or if we can't sell gas or there's more than we can sell, it will go to the flare um, and then ignite and burn off so that we don't just have gas escaping into the atmosphere. So we're going to have potential for fire there around the flare if oil comes through here for example we can see the nice grass in the background some of it appears to be dead if oil were to come through that and push through be pushed through by the gas ignite you know with the igniter and then blow through the air you know fly in the air because of the pressure and then blow towards that field it would potentially ignite that field so a big thing to prevent flare fires is to make sure that your treater is working properly um, and that all your valves the dump valves are working properly and that uh, if it is upset that you shut it in before you just you know potentially allow for a serious incident to happen. We also have internally here inside of the treater, you'll see on the left here, this is a horizontal treater, sometimes you know uh, similar to a separator. In this instance, you have a lot of different things that can leak and allow gas and vapor to fill a treater. Um, there's not typically a lot of ignition sources inside of the building, but if you look in the picture to the right, there are ignition sources intentionally designed to provide heat uh, elements uh, in the burner of the treater, which keeps the treater or the separator at a specific temperature. That can be adjusted. Essentially, it's a pilot inside of there so that the, if you see that little um, metal stainless steel um, deal at the end of this called a burner, the cover of that can be removed and you can um, light the pilot in there and then there's gas from inside of the treater that's feeding the pilot and you can adjust that uh, the height of that pilot to essentially and that's having feeder gas from the treater uh, to you know keep the treater at a specific temperature to allow for better separation of oil and gas now there's obviously a stack vent on there so you're going to have some heat there but again if you have a lot of gas inside of the building these things are not constructed completely sealed like you'll see that there's a window there for example um, and if that window's open it's full of gas inside that will make its way outside it'll find the ignition source inside of the burner now there are some you know barriers for that to happen so you know once it gets outside ventilation is going to kick in etc but it's a possibility so just keep that in mind that treaters are extremely high hazard for potential fires um, on a well site um, here's an example of an outdoor or an exterior um, separator. Now this one also has, as you can see, a much bigger stack. That is also going to be hot. And if you have a gas that only needs a certain temperature to ignite, that could potentially ignite it. Nice thing this is outside, so you know it's going to disperse any gas that releases relatively quickly. But again, it just depends on how much and where it's coming from. So keeping the valves in good shape, unions, making sure they're tightened, especially after winter time here as we're getting warmer, you're gonna see some, uh, some looser fittings because the ice is kind of formed in there and potentially loosened things and we may have to re-tighten, re-grease, reseal, et cetera. And then around the wellhead, uh, we obviously have some issues. There's an ESP here on this specific one, but every single one of these valves, unions, hammer unions, uh, check valves, uh, all these different parts and pieces can potentially release a uh, vapor that can be ignited. Training is also important. Now this is uh, what we would consider the theoretical side of fire extinguisher safety and training. There's also a hands-on version. So here's an example of us doing some hands-on training. Uh, we can do this at your facility. We can do it at our facility. We can do it out in the middle of a field somewhere, um, really wherever, you know, you can have enough space to do it. Um, as long as you don't mind getting some powder around. Um, but yeah, it's important that if you're expected by your company to put fires out of any size for any reason that you've actually had some practical experience and not just the theoretical classroom. I fashioned myself a, a relatively decent instructor, probably not the best, hopefully not the worst you've ever had. But uh, it's not going to prepare you to actually put a fire out. I could explain it in detail. I could, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But it's not going to prepare you effectively to extinguish a fire. So. This is important and required if you're required to put out um, fires. So inspecting uh, extinguishers, it's also important um, that the extinguishers in your facility are inspected, in your truck are inspected. I mean, honestly, even the ones in your house, you probably have one in your house under your sink somewhere. Make sure that's inspected and it'll properly work. Over time, the ABC powder type extinguishers, and there's different types, but the powder style extinguisher, that powder does compact 
especially in the back of a pickup truck. It'll come packed with vibration. Um, so just keep that in mind. They do need to be inspected. Make sure that powder gets loosened up, etc. Once a year at minimum, then five years and 12 years. Um, over time, they do break down, especially if they're exposed to elements, etc. So again, different types of extinguishers out there. Uh, we have straight water. That's good for a Class A fire, for example. We have foam, and that, depending on the type of foam, that can be a B and C, which is most common, but it could be A, B, and C. Carbon dioxide, that's an oxygen remover. So that can be used in a lot of different applications wherever oxygen um, is, is a main element for the fire. Powder, that's typically going to be our ABC style uh, fire extinguisher. Sometimes, depending on the powder, it can even be a K. And then wet chemical, which is specifically designed for a K style um, uh, fire. So what that does, the wet chemical, is it coats um, the flammable material and then does not allow the permeation of oxygen back to the heat source. So it allows the material to cool so that it cannot reignite. Fire extinguisher use, um, you know, again, kind of what I just went over there. Um, you want to make sure that the type of extinguisher you have is designed for the type of stuff that you're working with. Now, there's even more than that. You have Halon, which isn't really allowed in uh, uh, private industry anymore uh, because it's, it removes so much oxygen so quickly that it'll actually cause people to, to, to pass out because they don't have enough oxygen to breathe. Uh, that's a problem. Back in the day, and I used to have this in the training. I actually shouldn't put it back in because it's interesting. I was actually in uh, Whitefish, Montana a couple months back at this antique kind of rock shop place. And they had some of these old fire, um, they're the glass bulbs and they would hang in the ceiling and they'd have a wax ring around them. And if the wax ring ever melted, uh, which can happen you know, at certain temperatures, that ball would drop. And with, if that ball dropped, it released a, a gas and the gas, it was called a hydrogen tectochloride. Don't ask me why I remember that, but it's, it's burned in my memory. Hydrogen tectochloride would act similar to halon and remove all of the oxygen for about 50 feet, 60 feet. Now, they used to have them inside of buildings. That was the, you know, before sprinklers. And, you know, sure enough, fires would happen or just high heat would happen. Like, it'd get 120 and the AC broke or they didn't have AC. Wax ring would melt and everybody goes down, you know, in the building. So... They, yeah, they kind of moved away from that for obvious reasons. Uh, very effective, though. Very effective, but uh, not safe for people. I should actually put that back in here. I asked him if I could buy the, the, the thing, and he said, no, I, I think it's pretty hard to get your hands on those. And, and honestly, probably not the best thing to have around anyway. I know some pretty irresponsible safety people, so we wouldn't want to have that around. All right, so I'm obviously presenting a lot of information here. Um, it's going to be easy to forget some of this. I, I recognize that. So there's this fantastic NFPA fact sheet out there, which covers most of what I'm talking about in front and back page. So you might be asking yourself, John, why don't you just read off the sheet? Well, because, you know, how do you make a, a 50 slide presentation with a front and back page? No, there's, there, there's some good information here. It's very specific to types of fire extinguishers. Highly recommend having this printed out and available uh, if you're interested in reading it or if it's Saturday night and you're like, man, I got nothing to do. Should I watch Netflix or read the NFPA fact sheet? And I know that the NFPA fact sheet is going to win out every time. All right, moving on. We're going to get into fire extinguisher use here. So how to use it again. This is theoretical. This is not practical. Not very effective at actually teaching you because when you physically get to fight a fire with an extinguisher, it's a different experience entirely. So you want to remember the word pass, pull, aim, squeeze, sweep, side to side. So pull, aim, squeeze, sweep, side to side. That's your pass. So the first step is pull. A lot of people forget that. They'll go out and they'll aim and they'll try to squeeze the handle. They forget to pull the pin. That's most commonly, for my training, the most commonly forgotten step. And then sweeping, actually, people don't do a very good job either, but pulling the pin is, is kind of primary. So if fires are small, we call that our incipient stage of fire. That's when you want to, you know, go out and fight a fire. We want to make sure our extinguishers are, you know, within spec. And that's just something probably not a great time. Like if the fire starts and you like look at the extinguisher, you're like, man, this hasn't been inspected since 1992, which I have seen. Um, <laughs> that's a bad time to note that problem. So we want to obviously keep up, keep up on our fire extinguisher inspections. Um, before we, we go to fight a fire, we want to make sure that everyone's out, first of all, 
and that it's small and contained, right? There, in this is the other reason it's extremely important to actually physically, practically put out a fire. You kind of get a feel for how big a fire um, will prevent you from fighting it, right? Like, it's like, oh my gosh, like this is con- in our system, for example, our simulator, um, practical simulator. It's like, this is real, uh, this is powerful. And I'm barely putting it out with this big old extinguisher. If I was in like a, a, a situation where a treater was on fire or something big, like it's going to be way over my head way too quickly. So small and sip in stages only. Make sure everyone else is out. Again, we want to make sure everyone's trained. That's number four there. And then pull, pull the pin for step. You want to aim secondly. You don't have a lot of time with these extinguishers. 30 seconds is kind of like the max, max you're ever going to see. You want to aim at the base of the, of the flames. Um, you know, right at the bottom and you're going to notice this especially when you do the practical exercise because if you don't you're not going to get it out in time before the extinguisher is spent squeeze the handle and then sweep side to side and you're you're going to feel a sense of corralling this thing um, essentially towards one area to where you can you know your the the impact area of your extinguisher is enough to completely engulf it and put it out and number nine um, and this is important kind of already mentioned this if you are not sure if you can put the fire out you gotta go first of all you always want to make sure there's an exit you never want to unless like that's the only way out and you have to fight your way out um you never want to put yourself in a situation where you're putting yourself with you're you're not allowing yourself an egress route or a way out so that's another thing you want to make sure you always have a way out and if you're not sure if you can put it out don't it's just time to go that's the other reason before you put out a fire it's important to let everyone know um because what happens if you're like oh i gotta fight this fire real quick you don't let anyone know it gets out of control and you run out of the building but there's people that now can't get out because too much time has passed and their window is gone and that can happen very extremely quickly with fires so keep that in mind your safety comes first assets can be replaced treaters can be replaced well sites can be replaced every you know equipment and assets are insured typically and can be replaced you cannot be replaced so do not put your life at risk to put out a fire all right so moving into emergency response and exit plans which is kind of what we've been leading into in the last couple slides um, you know, there are some different types of emergencies outside of fires. We've kind of discussed fires in depth here today. Uh, but lightning and thunderstorms is another thing, especially on production facilities where fires can happen. Uh, hydrogen sulfide releases are another example. It's important more than anything, regardless of the type of, of emergency, that you have a plan. Um, if a monitor goes off, if a fire starts, if a big storm rolls in, that's not the time to be like, man, what should we do? That should already be discussed, understood, potentially practiced and drilled on before the event happens. When I treat, when I do this in person and I, you know, I have an audience and I can ask questions, one of the questions I ask typically to the oldest person in the room or the seemingly oldest person in the room is, hey, you know, when were you in elementary school? Oh, the 60s, the 70s, okay. What would you do when there was a fire drill? And they would, they'll explain it. I'd you know, put everything in the desk, put, make sure my shoes are on, go to the door, single file line to the hallway. And then I'd ask, which way did you turn? Oh, we turned to the left. Okay, then what did you do? We went out the double doors. Now what? We went into the playground or across to the parking lot or across the street. Right? Like people will remember that from the 70s when they were a child. You know, like ask them, you know, what color house they lived in, they may not remember, but they remember the fire drill. You know, these drills, I cannot emphasize how important these drills are. They they get into our mind. We start reacting with muscle memory instead of creative ability. In an emergency, creative ability cannot be trusted. You'll miss something. It always happens. So we want to be prepared. We want to make sure to know where fire alarms are, where gas detection equipment is, where our muster point is at all times, who to call, um, who the priority person to call is, who the person in our company is responsible for fire management, for rescue, for whatever it is. We want to have all that pinned into our brain, deeply, deeply rooted in our subconscious so that we're ready in that event and we don't have to think it through because we already have the plan established. 
Part of that is having an exit route and escape route planned. So we wanna make sure that these are posted, thought through and communicated to everybody. If it's a building, you know, where do we go outside of this building? If it's a well site, where is our muster point? I mean, this is pretty common, especially on well sites, uh, especially during like high H2S situations, but it's not a bad idea to have established at all times. Also escape routes, how are we gonna get to our, you know, uh, designed designated rather muster point? How are we gonna get there? Um, is, are we gonna have to run around a bunch of trucks? Are we gonna, is there a straight line? Should we go a different direction, etc.? cetera? Uh, this is extremely important, not just for fire, but really for any type of emergency, including you know uh, tornadoes up here specifically. It's kind of, we don't really deal with a lot of tsunamis or, or typhoons or you know, hurricanes, but um, you know, in any instance, you wanna make sure you have a plan. So historically, I go over this um, every year. I, I can't say it enough. I mean, this is kind of where it all started, the concept of fire safety, emergency exits, emergency exit planning, requirements for emergency exits and egress, um, you know, buildings being locked, et cetera. And in 1911, uh, in New York City, there was uh, essentially a shirtwaist factory or clothing factory. And it was a larger factory. This is kind of the, the birthing of the Industrial Revolution, right? The factories are getting big. Automation is getting big. And there was a company called the Triangle Factory. And they, uh, they noted that people were clocking in, going home, coming at the end of the day, and clocking out. And getting paid for the whole day, even though they didn't work. There were just too many people. It was impossible to kind of, like, make sure everyone was there. So rather than developing a you know, maybe a smarter system for managing that process. They decided to just, once you're in for the day, everyone gets in, they just lock and bar the doors. And then you don't leave until the day's over. Well, part of that was you couldn't go outside to smoke. So what they believe happened is that somebody uh, on one of the middle to upper floors was smoking a cigarette, uh, put it in a trash can, didn't go out, lit the trash can on fire. And then you have, you know, a factory full of clothing and the whole place went up. It was, you know, Kind of the, one of the most horrific workplace accidents ever um, recorded, ever, you know, for even since then, um, because of the nature of the fire and how bad it was, and that no one could get out. Um, that's that's kind of what spawned a lot of the uh, the initial talks of even OSHA coming into existence were instances like this. So that's history. Um, present day, this wasn't that long ago. I think it's been a couple years ago now. But in Pakistan, there's a fire, killed 312 people, injured another 600. Uh, boiler exploded and flames caught chemicals and exit doors were locked and windows were covered by iron bars. Again, you know, like it's probably a security measure to keep people from getting in that shouldn't get in. But again, instead of designing better material or better equipment or better security, um, they prevented people from getting out. And, they, they, you know, who knows how many people would have got out and how much less of an instance it would be if they'd allowed people to get out. So it still happens. Be thankful you're in America. There's rules and laws and you know, um, things like that. I don't know if they have an ocean in Pakistan, but some tells me if they do, it's not, uh, not quite the same. So any workplace emergency again, um, can happen. We want to make sure we have a plan. Um, anything that's going to cause damage or, or injury to people uh, at a large scale that's uncontrolled would be considered a workplace emergency. So we want to make sure that we report these things immediately. The more people that know about it, the sooner, the better. Right? We have an internal uh, app in our company called Slack that we use, and it's just a communication app. You can let everybody know what's going on, so we use it for you know, everything from just jokes and memes. I mean, we have a prayer channel, like a lot of different things that we use Slack for, but it's a way that we can communicate to everyone in the company instantly if they check their phone. We also have you know, the old school kind of bullhorns in the corner of the shop. Uh, we don't really use that very often, but we have phones. We have obviously cell phones, et cetera. Basically, you just need to have a plan to let everyone know it's time to get out, right? It's extremely important. Um, obviously, we want to uh, you know, communicate this internally first. If there is an incident or accident on a site, and we get into this a little bit more in depth on other trainings, but we want to make sure those get reported immediately that, uh, you know, supervisors know that upper management knows and that it can be handled appropriately, um, in, in the event of an emergency. And then if there's an inpatient hospitalization or amputation that needs to be related within 24 hours of fatality within eight hours. And that's uh, pretty important to note the change that happened. A lot of people weren't aware of that because it kind of happened silently, but it is the case. Emergency preparedness, some other things, um, mentioned this before, but I want to get more specific as far as having a strategy and what the strategy should entail 
when you um, are preparing for an emergency. So the first thing you want to look at is what can go wrong. What's the worst possible case scenario on this site, in this shop, in this field, in this area, during this job? And then work yourself back from there. And there may be two or three worst case scenarios, depending on like what if there's a fire? What if there was a gas leak? What if there what if this thing tips over? What if this breaks down? Whatever. You want to have those kind of as a starting point and then work your way back. What would we do in that instance? And then how do we prevent that from happening? So you kind of take two different paths, right? Like if this happens, this is what we do. But it really, more importantly, most importantly, how do we make sure that that doesn't happen and the other plan never has to be executed? So assess capabilities and resources. Um, maybe you have a fire truck that's, maybe you're doing work right next to a fire station. That, that's a great plan to use the fire station, but you should probably let them know um, that, you, that they're part of your plan, right? A lot of times companies will be like, call 911. It's like, does 911 even know where you are or what you're doing? Like, especially in you know rural North Dakota where we're two hours from anywhere, um, that being a part of the plan is typically not a good plan. I will challenge that any day. If I see an emergency plan that says call 911 and I'm like, all right, we're 45 minutes from Watford City, an hour from Williston, and 60 minutes from Dickinson. And I recognize that's an hour, but just wanted to shake it up a little bit. Uh, we're, you know, Newtown's 25 minutes away, you know, Mandan's 89 miles away. And they're like, call 911. I'm like, the fastest 911 is going to get here is an hour, an hour and a half. And if they're your your rescue uh, solution, we're in trouble. So kind of keep that in mind. So we want to integrate the plan with the community plan again, get them involved, make sure everyone's trained, conduct drills and exercises. I got that double pointed there. And then develop audit procedures, meaning, you know, every once in a while I look through it, make sure it's accurate. All right, I beat that to death. I know, I'm sorry, but we're going we're gonna to move. So um, if... An incident happens and, and you're involved and, and required to help. Um, there's two different types of agencies that would get involved. You have enforcement role versus non-enforcement roles um, in different groups. So they're going to show up and kind of be involved. And the question is, if the state shows up, who's in charge? Well, let me tell you, the state is not in charge. Um, the federal government is not in charge unless it's there, you know, unless it's on their land and then they're absolutely they're in charge. But typically, you're, the company is going to have an incident commander. Uh, you're going to have safety involved. You're going to have an information person, a liaison person with federal officials. And that's who the federal officials are going to talk to is that liaison. Then you're going to have your operations groups, your planning groups, your logistics groups, and your finance group, which we usually don't worry about. They, you know, they're not there on site. <laughs> Typically, logistics, planning, operations, incident commander, and safety are all on site on the ground. And the incident commander's job is to make sure that all these people have the right materials and equipment and knowledge of the plan um, and then, you know, as far as dealing with the government and agencies, that's going to be the information and liaison people. All right. Another important element of information. Typically, the person is called the public information officer or public information agent or somebody. You do not, in any instance, for any reason, want to give an interview to the news or anybody, if you're involved or have knowledge of this, Ever. You don't talk to them. There's somebody whose job is to do that. And they will be very angry with you. The company will be very angry with you if you're the person to do that. Same thing with incidents. I know in North Dakota, there's uh, the Bakken fail of the day. And it's, uh, it's you know sometimes funny. It's, it's a way where people can post failures across the industry, issues that they see. I will say that if you are the person who publishes pictures, especially of an emergency situation, and you're not authorized to do so, you will probably be fired. There may be lawsuits. It can be very serious. So, you know, there's a guy in every company, even if it's a small mom and pop, whose job would be to talk to the media, talk to the press, post photos if necessary, etc. You want to run that through that person first. Just keep that in mind. If you don't, you will never come back to that location. It's possible you will not get a job again because, you know, there's a way to handle this information and there's someone whose job uh, is that. So, all right, I beat that to death as well, but keep that in mind. Do not be posting stuff. Don't be sharing stuff. Don't be talking on social media if you're involved. I mean, if you want to gossip about somebody else's stuff, you know, you're perfectly okay to do with that. But if you're in the know, you, ain't, you do not want to be sharing that, I promise you. I kind of already talked about the escape routes. Uh, we want to make sure... Fire alarms are available, uh, that there's a clear route to the exit route, at least 28 inches and a height of seven and a half feet. 
we cannot lock or block exits. We want to make sure that they're open, uh, that their access is, is relatively clear. Basically, from any point in the building, you need to be able to get to an egress route without being stopped um, or impeded in any way. And then, you know, here's an example, some examples of non-maintained exit routes. Okay, this middle photo I like to place there because, you know, buildings, we're, some of us work in buildings all day. Some of us are in a building once a month. Some of us never see the inside of a building unless it's our house, right? We don't have an office to go to. If we're in the field, though, and here's a frack. I think this is in West Virginia. This is a very tight location, and they have an on-site pit. Um, you can see that... Uh, it, egress route is a little bit challenging here right if you're in the middle of all this this mess and a fire happens or you know a tornado is happening or gas release where would you go i mean if you just started running you know <laughs> you could uh, very easily uh get turned around get stopped i mean the, a lot of things that could go wrong and obviously wind direction is going to matter but if your plan was to like run towards the pit that pit could catch on fire because it's full of flammable material um, so, for example, you know, having a plan, making sure everyone's aware of the plan, having people practice the plan and drill on the plan is extremely important. Um, but I like to give both kind of examples here. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Um, just a few slides left. Exit marking is important. You know, we need to have lighted signs so that we can be seen in the event of smoke. Um, typically, you know, a lot of times we're going to have some sort of uh, marking on the ground, whether it's a yellow line or an orange line, a uh, path sign, etc. These are important things to have. So kind of wrapping this up, we have four elements of a fire, but five classifications of fire. Now, the elements are what the combustion process, the classes is the type or are the type of fires. Hot work permits, which we're going to get into a little bit more here, are required for any temporary operation involving open flames or producing heat sparks, sparks or both when you're within 35 feet of an ignition source. So if there's already a flame going on or, you know, something of that nature, we want to make sure that we or, you know, potential leak for, of gas, we want to make sure we have a permit. Fire watch is somebody who sticks around after hot work's performed that has been permitted um, and they sit around for th or they're around for 30 minutes. I don't want to say sit around, but watching to make sure an ignition doesn't happen. In order to extinguish a fire, our method will be to pull the pin, the most forgotten part of this uh, scenario, aim the wand, squeeze the trigger, and then sweep side to side at the base of the flames. Emergency preparedness, it's important to always have a plan for what happens if things go wrong, but then also a plan to prevent those things from going wrong. All right, getting into welding, cutting, and hot work here. Again, we're going to go through this pretty quick. We have some definitions here. Again, hot work is typically anything, any hot work that's performed within an ignition source of 35 to 50 feet. Uh, can include work such as bolting, drilling, welding, brazing, etc. Uh, cold work is work performed that breaks into a process where possibility for combustion exists, again, under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Or if you remember from the NFPA symbol, anytime you see the number 3 on that material, which can be seen in the SDS if it's not labeled on the material itself. Tapping is anytime you break into a process. Typically, um, you know, it's a puncture type, um, but anytime you tap into something, it's a tap, right? Fire watch is anybody who is observing hot work and brazing. I don't know why that one blanked out on us there, but essentially it's, it's a type of hot work or joining of metal or materials. Um, all right, so we talked about this briefly in the last uh, uh, section there, but you know, eliminating hazards is kind of the, the, the best first step, right? Like, hey, there's a, a bunch of boxes in between us and the exit route here. Well, let's eliminate those boxes so that we can get out, right? That's a, the best thing we can do before we put on you know, some box cleats or something so we can trample over the boxes, which would be the last form, PPE. We want to make sure we start with eliminating the hazard First, substituting um, is, is potential. Um, second, then engineering controls, any sort of physical barrier or permanent physical barrier that prevents uh, the hazard from harming people. Awaring, uh, providing awareness is any sort of sign. Um, an exit sign would be an awareness strategy, a confined space entry sign, an H2S sign, etc. These are all awareness methods. Then we have administrative uh, controls. These are training. These are permits, these are JSAs, these are plans that we write, and then lastly, we have PPE. So PPE is the last line of defense against any hazard, and even in the hot work space or any fire space, you know, the Nomex suit is good, 
if we have to enter an area where a fire has already happened, but these other five sections are going to prevent the, ha the fire from happening in the first place. So getting into hazard elimination, we want to make sure that we don't allow for the fire to happen. Typically with fire, it's very simple. We have the four elements, right? We have um, heat, we have oxygen, we have chain reaction, we have fuel. If you can prevent fuel from you know being there in the first place, you're not going to have a fire. If you can prevent heat, you're not going to have a fire. If you can reduce the oxygen and flammable mixture, you're not going to have a fire. And if you can stop the chain reaction from happening, you're not going to have a fire. You remove any one of those elements, there's no fire. So ventilation, obviously the, the deal there is it prevents the, um, the combustible mixture from occurring because we have ventilation. And closing operations, same deal, and also preventing fuel from being there and then changing manufacturing processes or making sure that we don't allow a lot of heat into the equation. These are all engineering controls. These are elimination controls. These are methods and they're combined in this case. Methods to prevent the fire from happening in the first place. The most effective thing you can do. And then obviously, you know, making sure the stuff isn't stored correctly. Also eliminating uh, an elimination tactic. All right, so hot work, welding, and cutting program requirements. Here's an example of a welding cutting hot work program. Uh, any, any company may have one of these programs. Um, your company probably does. Make sure you read it and understand it. Yes, these can be boilerplate, meaning it may even say another company's name on it. God forbid, but it happens. You want to make sure that it's custom to your company. If you guys don't do welding, it may be good at the beginning of this to say in the scope, our company does not perform welding. But, you know, here's the hot work. You know, like, it's okay to say that. Like, be very specific. Make sure it's there. It should explain permitting requirements. Should have an example of your form, employee training requirements, etc. All these we want to make sure are in that program. Part of that will be, um, so this, this standard here is NFPA um, 51B. It's also 29 CFR 1910 3-3.2C. I'm not going to make you remember that, but essentially anything that's combustible materials need to be relocated or, you know, at minimum 35 feet horizontally from the work site. If relocation is a practical, impractical, combustible shall be protected with fire retardant covers or otherwise shielded with metal or fire retardant guards or curtains or enclosed or something. That is the standard. So essentially we have to prevent combustible materials from coming into contact with ignition sources. Pretty straightforward. Those two standards there. And that if we have to do work within that area, uh, then we're going within 35 feet, uh, we're going to be required to fulfill or fill out a hot work permit. Um, and again, there's lots of different types of hot work that can be performed anytime you're creating heat, cutting, grinding, drilling, you know, bolting, anything of that nature. What is a hot work permit? It essentially, it's everybody being on the exact same page as far as what the requirements are prior to starting the torch up or starting to bolt or starting to cut. And it's going to have a lot of different elements. Uh, it's going to ask where you're doing the work. Have you done gas detection? Have you looked for explosive limits, combustible gases in the area? Have you removed all material possible? Is there any dust around that could ignite? Is there wind coming in that could ignite or spread the flame? Is there oil, you know, gasoline, et cetera, that can ignite? Is there paper, wood, or plastic around that can ignite? A lot of questions you're going to have to answer. And when you answer those questions, you know, essentially there's a flow chart. Um, if all roads lead to green, then you're good to go. And again, whenever you have a permit, what's also required, a permit goes hand in hand with a fire watch. You can't have a permit without a fire watch. Like the permit says you need to have a fire watch because, hey, we're doing hot work within an area we know a possibility for a large scale fire is possible. So we want to make sure we have a fire watch. And again, 51B kind of cover these um, as well as all the other requirements for the fire watch. So they need to be trained. They need to have fire watch training. Um, and again, 51B clearly outlines the elements of those trainings. So with that, you can't ask any questions. Um, some questions I have is, uh, have you looked around your work site and, and you know, monitored it for potential um, issues? Have you, you know, um, done emergency planning? Have you executed emergency drills? These are questions I have for you. Um, if you haven't, get out there and do it. Um, again, this Saturday night, you know, when you're 
looking through Netflix, just remember that NFBA fact sheet. That's a joke. But uh, hope you do well in the quiz. See you all next month, and let's keep this safety going.